Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. So I want to thank you all for joining this evening. Uh, we know that uh, time is very precious, and this evening time um, can be very precious, especially with the families. And as I know very well, I have four children, so the evening is always very busy for us as we are wrapping up the day. I want to kind of get started with what we looked at at the last session. Um, and these were the previous session topics. So the first was knowing that we are at the end of the last days, what more needs to be completed before Christ calls us home? And that was the consideration. And clearly what we came to understand is there is nothing. There's nothing more that needs to be done before Christ calls us home. Uh, the prophecies have been fulfilled. We're waiting on his call uh, to be uh, with him in the clouds, in the air, and uh, we look to that daily. So we praise the Lord for that, that, uh, that it could be any moment as we wait in anticipation. We then looked at Matthew 24, 34, where Jesus said that this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, we didn't uh, put everything here on the screen, but we should know that passage very well. And the question then is if that generation has already passed away, what exactly did Christ mean? Now, uh, basically what we came to understood was that there were some portions, uh, I believe the first maybe 14 verses or so, that were uh, maybe uh, very specific to the time that uh, that, that generation was living in. Um, and there were some events that would take place that they would see and so on. But really as the Lord moved on uh, with the following verses, he was talking more about the second coming. And uh, although there are some secondary applications for us, the primary application then would be for a time in the future. Uh, so um, we looked at the fact that perhaps generation was referring to maybe uh, the people group or the race. Uh, but there are a few different interpretations that Alexander shared uh, with that. And uh, clearly we don't need to be dogmatic about it, but it's clear that it's talking about a time in the future especially as it concerns that verse. And then we moved on to what is the timeline before, during, and after the rapture? What happens to us and the ones left behind? Now, I will say that we didn't get to complete this, so we're going to kind of pick back up with that subject and hopefully move forward through uh, from the rapture to the millennium. Uh, so let's take a look at the chart that we have uh, used. And this gives us an idea and this is just um, uh, somebody's interpretation. Now, obviously, this is what we uh, look at from Scripture, and we uh, see these events in Scripture in this order. Uh, but it's a wonderful representation for us. And we see that the rapture takes place uh, before the tribulation, and we have verses for that. The judgment seat of Christ will happen at that time frame. Um, and this is really the time frame we're looking at. So from the rapture to the millennium, and we see that there's a judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema seat. Um, there is the tribulation, the great tribulation, Jacob's trouble, and so on, the abomination, desolation. Uh, and then we see the sheep and goat judgment, or the judgment on the nations. And we want to kind of discuss that. What are these? And uh, what people group is in view specifically? And um, what then happens to everyone else outside of those people groups? So, Let's go ahead and get to the, the questions then. And really, I just want to go ahead and start with the first one here. So who is being judged during the tribulation period, and what will the extent of this suffering be? Now, really what I want to know is what happens during the tribulation. That's a very broad question, I understand. So, uh, John Matthew, can you start us off, uh, give us you know just a short uh, maybe five minutes at most, explanation of what you see happening from rapture to millennium as an overview, and then we can maybe go deeper into some of those subjects. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would uh, I will give a brief outline from rapture to tribulation. Later on, you can focus the special subjects and uh, we can discuss it. The rapture can happen any moment in our life. So when the rapture happens, all the saints will be gone, the Holy Spirit will be taken out, and the world is going to plunge into anarchy. And th then 
I believe uh, United States and Western countries are going to face the most uh, critical time at that time. Because uh, the current population of USA is 331 million people. So many Christians are still here in armed forces and everywhere in America. As a conservative estimate, about 50 million believers disappear all of a sudden. What is going to happen? The country is going to plunge into anarchy. And the United States government will have to declare martial law and uh, going to introduce socialism. Government will take, up, take over all the means of production. That's, that's going to happen all over the world. So at that time, a person is going to offer peace and prosperity to everyone in this world. And he's going to come and he will be a great speaker. And he's going to take over this world. He's going to control everyone, and it, he won't allow any Christians to preach. All the Christians are gone from here, the, but the void will be filled by 144,000 evangelists from a Jewish group, from Israel. They will be the preachers. The greatest revival will take place at the tribulation period. And the Antichrist and his henchmen are going to behead them or kill them and destroy them. Uh, many of them, most of them. And at the end of the tribulation, and you know that seven year period, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back with the power and glory and to take over. And he's going to vanquish and destroy the Antichrist and his people and Oriental army in the Battle of Armageddon. And after that, there are two distinct judgments we can see in the Bible judgment of Israel and judgment of the Gentiles. That means sheep and goat judgment. He's going to establish a throne in the valley of Jehoshaphat, and he's going to bring all the Jews, Israel, believers to that valley. Two thirds of the people will be killed, and they left. One third of the people will be brought back and will judge them. And the believers, Jewish believers, they are going to enter into the millennium. And then consecutively, at the same time, I believe he's going to judge the Gentile Christians, Gentile believers. That's called a sheep and goat judgment. And then that sheep is going to enter to the millennium and the goat will be thrown into the lake of fire. From the book of Daniel, I get a glimpse. I'm not saying here dogmatically, but exegetical conclusion. Uh, I came to a glimpse from Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter. You know, the last period of the tribulation, three and a half years, or we call it 42 months, or 1,260 days. In Daniel 12, we see 30 days after that. 1,290 days. So I believe Jesus Christ is going to use that 30 days for the judgment of Israel, and judgment of the Gentiles. After that, we see in the book of Daniel, another 45 days. So after his second coming, Jesus coming, there are 75 days, if you calculate. Then book of Daniel give a date, uh, 1,335 days. So I believe within the 75 days, Jesus is going to complete the judgment of the Israel and the Gentiles, I'm going to restore the earth so that uh, the 76th day we can enter into the millennium with the uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers who are left and the others will be thrown in the lake of fire. That's the timeline I have it. And when you go to the in details and ask, you know, we'll be able to explain more. Okay, very good. Thank you, brother. So, yeah, that was interesting. You know, you brought up a good point, an interesting point, the difference in the the number of days in the timeline with the three different dates or, or length of days that are mentioned. Uh, but we can perhaps look at that in a little bit. Uh, so thank you for the overview. So what I want to do now, I guess, is uh, turn it to Alexander. And really the question then that I want to pose to you, uh, brother, is what it happens during the tribulation Exactly. So uh, we had from John Matthew an overview from the rapture to the millennium, but really there's a lot of events that take place in this specific time frame in that seven-year period. 
Um, and however, you, you, whichever portion you want to talk about or in its entirety, that's fine. But can you give us an idea of what exactly is going to take place and the effect it will have? And again, if you can do so, maybe in about five minutes or so, brother. Okay. Thank you very much. Good to join with you for this uh, discussional Bible study for our edification and biblical education. And it has been going very good. And I'm sure that we were able to fine tune many of the things which we already know from the prophetic scriptures. Uh, I just want to take maybe a minute to back up from the last week's discussion because, uh, you know, when we concluded, I thought there were still some little confusion in the minds of maybe uh, some of us. So Matthew 24, 34, there is uh, no need for us to look at the generation in terms of the length, you know, like because we discussed how many years is a generation. I don't think that is the point there. That probably would not make any sense if we apply the length of uh, a period of time in that verse. So it is just better to see it that generation refers to the people who will be living at that time. And just that would be the safest interpretation. Uh, and not, you know, thinking about how many years will that be, you know. So forget the years and duration. And uh, the generation is talking about the uh, uh, people who will be witnessing that future day events who will be living and who will be seeing and witnessing the tribulational events. Now, the other interpretation, as I mentioned, another possibility is that Genea can also refer to generation, a race or a family or a group of people. And some interpreters, uh, you know, believe it may be also a reference to the Jewish race who will be preserved in spite of the terrible persecution against them. So they will be there in God's providential plan and purpose. Nobody will uh, annihilate or destroy them. So then the other question was about Genesis 6-3, the 120 years. I again made a very brief study and uh, I couldn't find any scripture that specifically mandates or gives us a clear uh, specific uh, uh, you know longevity of our life lifespan uh, that 120 years may be a reference also to the 120 years uh, for the judgment to come my spirit will not strive with man uh, uh, all the time the earth was full of violence you know and the lord said 120 years more will be given to you then the flood will come so that may be a better way to understand that even though traditionally many people understand it as kind of a 120 years kind of lifespan most of the interpreters uh, I consulted lean towards this view that 120 years after uh, uh, 120 years of warning time, a window is given for repentance. After that, the flood will come. Okay. I just want to leave it uh, at that. Probably I just wanted to clarify it if you were interested to know little more details about it now coming back to the you know tribulation and what happens who is being judged in the tribulation the book of revelation gives us a very good answer to that question i know israel will be judged because they will be purified uh, jacob's trouble revelation jeremiah 37 it's called jacob's trouble so it has a specific purpose for the nation Israel to purify them to receive their Messiah. Then the nations will be judged and all the wicked people who are living at that time, who are not believers, who are not taken at the rapture, they will come under the wrath of the Lamb and also of God. Now, if you turn to the book of Revelation, 
there is a very good clue about the purpose of the uh, purpose of revelation in, in in a general way it has purpose to the world of unbelievers to the unbelieving nations and also to israel and a good clue is I, there are 11 references in the book of revelation to a particular category of people called uh, earth dwellers you know earth dwellers so the tribulation time according to the book of revelation is specifically geared toward it it has a specific reference specifically uh, to judge the earth dwellers so i'm going to read uh, probably most of those verses very quickly revelation 310 uh, we read uh, that's a very familiar verse because you have kept my command to persevere i also shall keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth so what is the purpose of tribulation this global universal tribulation will come to test those who dwell upon the earth now chapter 6 verse 10 the same phrase uh, occurs again in chapter 6 uh, verse 10 and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true until you judge and avenge the blood of those who dwell on the earth chapter 8 verse 13 again we read woe woe to the inhabitants of the earth then we find that in 11 12 uh, chapter 11 verse 10 it is repeated twice chapter 13 verse 8 chapter 13 verse 12 chapter 13 verse 14 chapter 14 verse 6 so uh, you know at least 11 times this particular phrase occurs that is the tribulation time is to test to judge to punish to condemn the earth dwellers so who are these earth dwellers i believe it is a technical word used by john uh, for people who are unbelievers who are bound to this earth who do not think about things above those who have made earth their home they are the enemies of israel enemies of the church enemies of god a parallel will be in the old testament when the children of israel when they entered the land there were people of the land you remember that phrase book of joshua deuteronomy and all people of the land the people of the land in the old testament were pagan people who they were enemies of israel's god they were enemies of the children of israel so in the same way in the book of revelation the earth dwellers are unbelievers and enemies of israel enemies of the church enemies of god's people and i believe this is a technical phrase uh, you know uh, to highlight uh, the role of the unbelievers during that time in the world and how god will judge them so uh, that is my take on it you know so who will be judged during the tribulation days one word answer from the book of revelation those who dwell upon the earth earth dwellers of course it will also okay brother so you made that sound quite simple uh earth dwellers will be just on the earth and uh you know praise the lord that the text is clear and the text is simple and plain most often, but I have a question, and I'll kick it back to you first uh, before we move to John Matthew. And the question is centered around these earth dwellers. So those that are on the earth during the tribulation, um, you mentioned that these earth dwellers would be those uh, that were 
essentially unsaved people. I think maybe even use the word pagan. Is that right? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, in the that is true. In the Old Testament, the people of the land yeah. were pagans. You know? Yeah. Okay. So. so my question is is about these people, the earth dwellers. And you see it here on the screen. So will people during the tribulation period have an opportunity to receive salvation? And does Revelation 7, verse 9 and 14 apply to those during the tribulation? Yes. Go ahead, yes. brother, again in five minutes or so. Okay. Uh, you know, most of us are familiar with uh, Revelation chapter 7, uh, which begins with the sealing of the 144,000. That is 12,000 from each tribe. And we read about them again in Revelation chapter 14. So, so if you compare chapter 7 and chapter 14, this is the message we get. That is, these are Jewish believers, specially, specifically selected by the Lord to be evangelists, to be the proclaimers of the gospel during that time the gospel of the kingdom that the messiah is coming and he will establish his kingdom repent believe and turn to him so the 144000 witnesses and as a result of their witnesses we read in 7 revelation 7 9 a great multitude which could not be which no one could number from all nations so many of them would turn to the Lord. Many among the earth dwelling will turn to the Lord during that time. And they will be preserved and uh, they will be, you know, uh, uh, they will go through the tribulation. Many of them would become martyrs, but the good news is that they are, they will become the children of God. So their status will change from earth dwellers to heavenly dwellers, you know or the citizens of heaven. So some of them will have that, uh, not some, but many will have that privilege. So uh, as you have asked in the question, chapter seven, verse nine and 14 is talking about the people who would come to know the Lord through the witnesses, witness of the 144,000 during the tribulation time. But generally speaking, the judgment during the time of tribulation is for those who are bound to this earth, those who have made this earth their home, earth dwellers, 11 times repeated in the book of Revelation. Okay, so that takes me to another question, but I, I don't want to get to that question just yet before I turn to John Matthew. So, John Matthew, the same question, then, and again, in, in a few minutes here, five minutes or so, uh, will the people during the tribulation have an opportunity to receive salvation? And do these verses apply? Now, I will say that, John Matthew, you brought up the 144,000 already earlier in your overview. And then Alexander, of course, reiterated that point and the function that they'll serve and uh, who will come to receive salvation through their preaching. So uh, why don't you go ahead and, and if you need to fill any gaps or you have anything you want to say, Go ahead and add to this topic. Uh, thank you, Raymond, for the question. That's the most important question. Most of the believers I talk to, you know, they are confused. They don't know. They think that after rapture, everything is finished. There's no chance for anyone uh, for salvation. So we have to make it clear. This 144,000 Jewish people selected from each tribe, they are sealed and Satan Antichrist and a false prophet, this 144,000 evangelists will be a, 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 a problem for them, a thorn on their side. But they cannot do anything because they, are, they will be sealed. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, we say that how they are sealed. It is their father's name written in their forehead. So their father's name is uh, written on the forehead. So whatever Antichrist and the false prophet, if even if they try to hurt them or harm them, nothing is going to work. And I call them um, 144,000 supermen. And we also are uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit. But these people, 144,000, these people have special powers, empowered by God to do miracles, 
and perform miracles and wonders. But when the tribes, you can see that two tribes are missing. The tribe of Dan and Ephraim are missing. They are, when we see the history, we see the 12 tribes. These two are missing just because I believe these two tribes led Israel into idol worship. That's maybe the reason. And uh, the priestly tribe of Levi is substituted for Dan and uh, Joseph is substituted for Ephraim. So these 144,000 people are going to preach and uh, millions of people are going to be converted. And it's another question, appropriate question you asked uh, from Revelation 7, 9, 17. Who are the un uncounted number of multitude there? Yon CA, Yon was overwhelmed. Yon uh, actually stood in consternation looking at this, uh, this special group. One of the elders, it's, it's, it's a, imagine, you know, one of the elders around the throne of Jesus caught his attention, John's attention, asked John, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? These two questions, this elder is asking John, do you think say, this elder doesn't know the answer? The elder know, knew all along who they were, but God wanted John to know it, and God wants us to know it. At the end of the age, when John is caught up into heaven, when he see the church, you and me there, enthroned, and he see elders also, then he was perplexed. Who, is, who are these people? And that's why the elder is explaining. They came from multitude, millions of people. They have martyrdom. They received martyrdom from Mighty Christ. They are there. And the, only, uh, the elder is explained it to John, and we know that uh, the millions of people will be saved in the tribulation period, and they will be killed by the Antichrist. And the, but the, they are not a part of the church. But the distinction there between this group and the church, the church, we, we, we have thrones. This great multitude has no thrones. They stand in the presence of the throne. They have no crowns. They have palm branches. They have come after the rapture. So there's a distinction between the church believers, New Testament believers, and the tribulation saints. So Elder is explained into John and his confusion was solved. So he was perplexed. That's my answer. Thank you for this question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, brother. So, uh, you know, both uh, really giving the, the same response, and that's wonderful, uh, citing different verses. And certainly it's clear uh, through the portion that we just looked at in Revelation 7. And, um, and obviously, as we consider uh, the next topic, you know, as we consider the millennium, um, how then the people will come about to fill the earth and populate and so on. It just makes logical sense. So, but I have a question. Um, so the, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, salvation will come and you mentioned John, John Matthew, that there will be a distinction uh, between the church mm -hmm. and those that uh, receive salvation and uh, you were trying to make a distinction there, but you didn't really explain a whole lot different. Can you explain some of the differences that will um, that will be during, let's just say, as an example, the millennial time frame for those that are taken up in the rapture and for those that um, receive Christ through the 144, 144,000? Yeah, the difference is that uh, from the day of Pentecost to rapture, Believers, New Testament believers are the bride of Christ. They constitute a church. So the believers in the tribulation period, they, they are not a part of the church. So we have a special, as a bride of Christ, we have special uh, benefits. And, and these believers, just I mentioned, they have, they have no crowns. They have palm branches in stock. They have, uh, they don't have thrones. And we have thrones. So we are a distinct group of people, and they are a different group of people, and they will be also ruling, and they will be also with Jesus, and they will be ruling in the millennium with the Christ also, just like we are. But there is a distinction mm -hmm. with, between bride and uh, bridesmaids. 
Hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, I appreciate that distinction and saying that uh, the church is the bride of Christ, which we very well know. And uh, and then you said bridemaid, so perhaps maybe friends of the bridegroom. Uh, we've seen that that uh, used in Scripture. Um, in, in any event, uh, Alexander, I want to go ahead and bring this to you. If you have any additional thoughts, but if not, I have a different question for you. Do you okay. have anything you would like to add to no. the question that I just asked? Um, nothing much to add. I think uh, it's a very basic truth. Uh, all of us who interpret the Bible dispensationally, that is one of the, you know, uh, essential truths of dispensationalism, the distinction between the church and Israel. Actually, dispensationalism stands or falls on that uh, distinctive doctrine. So if that cannot be maintained, if we cannot show that from the scripture, then there is no dispensationalism as such. But we can clearly show that, you know, from even from the book of Revelation after chapter, after the church age, the church is not seen until later in the book after the second coming uh, of Christ. And then we see the bride again with him and uh, ruling and reigning with him. So absolutely during the tribulation time, there is no mention uh, of the church at all. There is mention of saints, mention of 144,000, mention of salvation, mention of people who are, you know, saved, but they are quite different from the church age saints. Now, uh, one more thing before you move on to the next question. If you can highlight chapter 14, verse 6 on the screen, uh, that will put in perspective all what Brother John Matthew shared and also what I shared. I think it's a beautiful verse, chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, I will read that. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. See, the gospel is preached during the tribulation, to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and uh, the springs of uh, water. So the angel flying, with the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth and uh, who are preaching and brother john matthew brought that out very clearly the hundred and forty four thousand because chapter 14 the first verses is all about the hundred and forty four thousand so they will proclaim the gospel during the tribulation time to the earth dwellers so in verse 6 also that phrase is there you know, everlasting gospel for those who dwell upon the earth. I'm really caught up on that oh. word, that phrase. <laughs> so that's <laughs> yeah, a very good that, clue to understand the book of Revelation and especially the tribulation period. Yeah, no, you, uh, I think very well it illustrates for us who is in view. So I appreciate you bringing that out. Now, I want to go ahead and move to the next question. Um, now we're going to open up for questions in just a moment, and I did receive one, um, but uh, I want to, to get this out before we continue. And, and uh, brother, if you can answer this in a few minutes, and then we'll go to John Matthew on the same question. And I know it's going to be difficult in just a matter of a few minutes, but uh, since the U.S., the USA is not named in Scripture, you know, what part uh, will the U.S. have moving forward into eschatology? So, um, you know, where does the U.S. show up in, in prophecy? Is there a place for the U.S. in prophecy? Okay, very good question. We are all very curious about it. And uh, so it may be very unwise on my part to give any, you know, dogmatic kind of uh, answer to this question. But we can probably, I can make some suggestions that will not contradict the scriptures. So 
uh, I have thought about it. I have spoken about it. People have asked questions about it to me. So my first response will be many modern nations are not mentioned in the scriptures. Many of them are not, you know. So the United States of America also is not mentioned. It's no surprise. I think there are like um, 195 nations registered in the United Nations today. And, um, you know, many of, many of those nations are not mentioned uh, in the scriptures, the modern nations. The Bible prophecy is mainly concerned with the Holy Land and the nation Israel and its immediate neighbors and Israel's enemies. That is why the United States is not mentioned in the scripture because the USA has never been an enemy of Israel. It has always been a, you know, a friend and a supporter of Israel. So the Bible prophets were primarily concerned with whole Holy Land and its immediate neighbors, especially the enemies. Now, my third suggestion is, I believe probably with uh, at least with some of you that God made America strong and powerful at, as the topmost nation on earth uh, to bless his church uh, through the resources and the financial resources and the support for missions and uh, ministries and global evangelization and also to support and to protect Israel during the church age. Because after the church age, the Lord is going to directly protect Israel. You know, he's going to directly intervene. But today, during the times in which we live, God uses nations like the United States to protect and to support Israel. We know that it is because of the military might of the United States that many of the hostile forces around Israel, they are afraid to touch Israel because they are afraid of Israel to some extent, but probably they are more afraid of the United States. So God's purpose for the United States is for the church age in two respects. One, to bless the church in its global proclamation of the gospel and missions. And number two, to protect the nation Israel. Once the rapture takes place, then America has no place in God's plan because by the time of the rapture, that plan is fulfilled. I believe that may be the reason that the United States is not seen in prophetic scriptures because bulk of the prophetic scriptures talks about the post rapture scenario. Bulk of the prophetic scriptures talk about the post rapture scenario and the United States probably will have no significant place after the rapture. Maybe it may become weaker militarily, economically, or it may merge with the European Union as a Western bloc, losing its superpower status and the superpower status may be given to the European Union, you know, and uh, initially the United States may also have, may be incorporated into that. So that is uh, what I think about it. Okay. Yeah, brother. So I appreciate those thoughts. And certainly I pray that uh, what you're saying, that uh, the U.S. will really be a stronghold for uh, sending gospel workers and uh, proclaiming Christ uh, throughout the nations, protecting Israel. I pray that will indeed take place um, well, for as long as the Lord allows. Now, John Matthew, I want to go ahead and, and pose the same question to you. If you have anything additionally you would like to share, and I do have one question that came through that's relevant to what we have discussed already, and uh, you should be able to answer that in a pretty quick answer, yes or no, and then we'll open uh, for questions. So, John Matthew, do you have anything you would like to add 
to this question about his U.S. Yeah. name. Thank you. This is a, a permanent question frequently everyone asks. I completely agree with the Dr. Alexander Gurian's assessment. After the rapture, I believe that the USA will be weakened, will be a part of the Western Alliance led by Antichrist. So right now, the USA is the greatest champion in the history of this universe. Although leftists in America, in the third world countries, they think that America is founded on injustice. There was slavery one time. They propagate, but America was founded for good. It did good for everyone in this world. Look at this technology, iPhones, phone technology, GPS, all this technology America invented and they gave the world free of charge. Imagine a Hitler type person become the president of America. America could capture the whole universe and could do that, but they did not do it. But they always go and support the downtrodden people and help others. So America got raised for a good purpose and after the rapture, it will disappear into oblivion. And like if you see the Babylon, the great revelation, that system is affecting the fall of the great Babylons may affect indirectly to America and the Western countries also. Uh, that's my assessment. Mm. What's the question now? Yeah, thank you, brother. So I appreciate that and really just kind of uh, echoing Alexander's thoughts and reinforcing that. So the question that uh, I'll start with now with the last few minutes that we have for the question and questions that may come from those that are listening. Uh, this is one question that was sent. So will Gentiles as well as Jews have the same opportunity for salvation during the tribulation? Now, uh, I guess just to kind of uh, set up the question a little bit. You were talking about the 144,000. You were mentioning that they were going to be um, Jewish, right? And uh, I guess the target audience. Now, I know Alexander is going to use his key phrase for the evening, probably, uh, those that dwell on the earth, but we'll, we'll get to Alexander in a moment. Let's go to John Matthew first. Uh, what would your answer be to this question? And try to keep it short so we can keep other uh, I get other so, questions as well. God willing, I think in uh, next meeting, I think you know the subject, the uh, judgment of Israel and mm -hmm. judgment of uh, God, uh, sheep and goat, mm -hmm. the will uh, give up uh, good answers for that. Of course, Gentiles as well as you have the same opportunity because uh, sheep and goat judgment, that's judgment for the Gentiles all over the world. And uh, judgment for Israel, for Jews, one third left. Two thirds of the Jews will be killed, and one third will be brought to the valley of Jehoshaphat by angels. And uh, Jesus is going to judge them, and uh, he's going to judge the Gentiles. The Revelation, the seven nine seventeen, the one you discussed before, the multitude you are talking about Gentiles mainly. That we answered. John had a confusion, and the elder came and explained to him who are they. They were killed. They are martyrs. Uh, uh, they received martyrdom and the numerous, numerous millions of believers, Gentiles and Jews, will be there, will be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, brother. So as you mentioned, uh, I think it will be clarified even more for everyone when we get to the sheep and goat judgment. And as we probably tie in some of what we read in Matthew, some of what we read in Daniel, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. and Revelation, as we tie together these thoughts into the sheep and goat judgment into what you were saying. Alexander, how then would you respond to this question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same question. So do you have anything to add? Will Gentiles as well as Jews have the same opportunity for salvation during the tribulation? Yeah, as it has been abundantly made clear uh, through the witness of the 144,000, the earth dwellers, the pagans, the Gentiles, and the unbelievers, generally speaking, who are living, um, you know, uh, um, who live on the earth at that time, uh, many of them will turn to the Lord. And we read that in Revelation chapter 7. And uh, we also read in the book of Daniel, Jeremiah, and even in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, 
and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So those who pierced him is a reference to the Jews. During the tribulation, they will come under God's judgment. God will purify them as a nation. And finally, in repentance, they will look to their Messiah, embrace their Messiah, and there will be a national repentance and turning to the Messiah and receive him as their uh, king. So definitely, uh, nation Israel, the Jews also will have a tremendous opportunity during the time of the tribulation to receive their Messiah through uh, repentance and through confession. And, uh, you know, uh, Revelation begins with that statement that those who pierced him, the day is coming that they will look to him. Thank you, brother. Yeah, so thank you for clarifying that. And this is a you know, very important question um, as we consider salvation during the tribulation period. Um, so thank you very much. And now it was clarified that, yes, it is open to the Jews and to the Gentiles. However, John Matthew also clarified the fact that uh, access to Christ, if we want to, I don't know if I should be so bold to say it that way, but access to Christ seems to be different as the bride of Christ or as the friend of the bridegroom, uh, perhaps responsibility and so on. We don't know exactly how that will be, as John Matthew was uh, referencing, alluding to. Uh, so we, the point is that we should not wait. Today is a day of salvation, and we should not wait for the 144,000 to preach the gospel. We should be doing that now uh, because we know that many will perish, many will die, uh, and many will not uh, receive Christ because of judgment that will fall on the earth dwellers as Alexander has pointed out to us. So uh, salvation is available, but uh, we shouldn't pass up the opportunity now to preach the gospel to those. And I know that both of you feel uh, the same about that. Now, I want to open it up for questions. So we have about nine minutes left. Maybe we can use about eight minutes of that uh, for questions. Now, I'm going to unmute those that are on the phone. So we have uh, a few different phone lines that are called in. Everyone else is, look like, uh, looks like they're using the app. You can unmute yourself, and, uh, but I'm going to unmute the phone lines. And if whoever has a question, you can ask the question, and whoever talks first, everyone else will be muted thereafter. So the phone lines will be unmuted now. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask? Well, uh, um, you can um, get some whatever mail you got. Um, Anybody have any questions? Well, it sounds like nobody has any questions. That's good. So um, that means I can start asking questions to everyone else then. Uh, everyone, uh, I guess, feels comfortable with what was discussed this evening. Um, what we will look at, just so you know, for next session, which will be next Monday, the sessions will be on Monday evening, um, we will look at then the sheep and goat judgment, so we can hopefully clarify some of these topics that uh, have been briefly discussed, and maybe we can discuss the mechanics of how everyone will get to uh, one valley. Uh, so everyone from all over the world will come to one place for the sheep and goat judgment, and uh, discuss a little bit more maybe, even though it's been clarified, who is in view in that judgment, but how will it take place, when will it take place? John Matthews kind of alluded to some of that with the number of days uh, and the differences that we see in Daniel and so on. So maybe we can look at some of the details there. So if there are no questions from anyone, and I'll give it just one other opportunity, if there's any questions from anyone, feel free. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Raymond, hello. Yes, brother. I, can I just read uh, one quotation from David Jeremiah? Yes, please. Okay, this is about what we were discussing about the United States. And, uh, you know, I found this in my notes and it's very interesting, even though it is not a, it is just a suggestion like uh, we all made. Um, the, this is just a suggestion, and uh, we should take it in that value. Um, 
the United States in prophecy, you know, God's major plan and purpose for America will be fulfilled by the rapture. If the rapture were to happen today, the country will lose a minimum of 25% of her population and she would also lose the salt and light of the nation. After this time, only evil people will be left in America and this will further a reverse surgical operation, one in which all the healthy cells are removed and only the cancerous ones are left to consume one another. So I think, you know, that explains very well and complements some of the suggestions we already made. Yeah, yeah. I also completely believe, yeah. that, you know, about 50, uh, you know, so a lot of Christians will be gone. They are in the armed forces and all of a sudden, yes, all these evil people will be left and then America no longer will be a force. Yes. Well, with the wicked wickedness that will be left even uh more reason for us to be diligent now in the time that we have left uh, well thank you brothers for uh for your time and and for your answers and and for everyone else that was able to join uh hopefully it was insightful hopefully uh you were able to understand and and uh, hopefully apply and give us a sense of urgency about how we would share our faith and the gospel We'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. I would like to ask, is there someone that's willing to close with a word of prayer for us? I'll go ahead and close. Dear Father, we just thank you for this time to read and study your word. We just thank you that we will be with you forever. We thank you for your son that it's not because of our merit but only because the lord jesus christ died and paid for our sins thank you for the books of daniel and revelation that tell us about the end and that we will be with you forever we will have joy forever because of your love and care we pray this in the lord jesus christ's name amen, amen. amen. thank you good amen. night thank you brother. thank you good night Thank you. Thank you all. You all have a wonderful evening. Good evening, Valsa. Good evening. How are you? That's good to see you, sister. Good to see you too. Thank you.